Who are you consulting with consistently so that you're ready on day one? I'm speaking with myself, number one, because I have a very good brain and I've said a lot of things. Stabilizing, uh, dangerous, uh, dangerous to the United States, dangerous to the world order, if you will. Here to explain Donald Trump's foreign policy <laughs> to us. Oh boy. <laughs> Don't do that to me. <laughs> it's very easy to think of Donald Trump as basically just saying incoherent things when he talks about the world, in part because he often does. I would bomb the shit out of him. The issue, though, is that when you look underneath all of them, he, he has a worldview. It's actually fairly clear. For Donald Trump, his worldview is transactional. If you pay a lot of money, the U.S. will help you. If you don't pay a lot of money, the U.S. won't. And it really is that simple. We are being ripped off by everybody in the world. We're defending other countries. We are spending a fortune doing it. They have the bargain of the century. You need to take those ideas seriously. You need to engage with them and say, let's assume it is President Trump. Let's look at the fact that of all the things a president can and cannot do, foreign affairs, foreign policy is the area where he has the freest hand. He doesn't need Congress. When I heard that we were first going into Iraq, some very smart people told me, well, we're actually going for the oil. And I said, all right, I get that. I get that. There's nothing else. I get it. We should take it and pay ourselves back. Why, what are we doing? Trump's idea of taking the oil speaks to two things, really, about the way that he views the world. The first one is that he sees basically everything through the lens of what does America get out of it. They pay us peanuts. We're defending them. The second part is that Trump thinks of good for the United States as controlling stuff. I said, keep the oil, keep the oil. I mean, we could theoretically do it, but Iraqis wouldn't just give the oil to Americans. Almost certainly it would fight a war. Thousands of people would die. It would be an immensely complicated and dangerous occupation, dwarfing even the 2003 Iraq invasion. For two years I've been telling you, take the oil, hit the oil, bomb the oil. He thinks of things in this narrow, mercantilist, what's good for me is when I own stuff and sell it to you, good deals versus bad deals. How are we gonna take the oil? How are we gonna do that? You just, you would leave a certain group behind and you would take various sections where they have the oil. They Foreign policy is about managing your relationship with other countries. It's not just about dominating them. More to the point, we don't believe in imperialism as a mode of governance. In the old days, when we won a war, to the victor belonged the spoils. The 28 countries of NATO, many of them aren't paying their fair share. And that bothers me because we should be, yes, we're defending them and they should at least be paying us what they're supposed to be paying. The issue is that NATO countries promise to pay a certain amount of their GDP towards defense. Other than the US, almost no countries do it. So when Trump says they're not paying their fair share, he's right. And NATO's too expensive because we can't afford this anymore and people are being brought in for a free ride. Where it gets dangerous is how he takes that to an extreme. And the extreme isn't, therefore NATO should pay more. It's, therefore, if Russia invades, we'll rethink whether we come to the defense of NATO countries. If they don't make us whole, they may have to defend themselves. In the NATO charter itself is one article in particular called Article 5. I don't think he knows what Article 5 is. Which says that if you attack any NATO member, the other 27 NATO countries have to come to its defense. And what Donald Trump is saying is that that core mission of NATO not only doesn't necessarily matter as much, but it's something that can be tossed aside. NATO exists solely to deter Russia. I believe an easing of tensions and improved relations with Russia from a position of strength only is possible, absolutely possible. For Vladimir Putin, this is his top strategic goal in many ways. They have spent 20 years trying to weaken NATO. And what Donald Trump is saying is, I'll give that to you. He's not going into Ukraine, okay? Just so you understand. He's not gonna go into Ukraine. All right, you can mark it down, you can put it down, you can take it anywhere well, you want. he's already there, isn't he? Okay. What you have Donald Trump saying about Vladimir Putin is astounding. If he says great things about me, I'm gonna say great things about him. What Vladimir Putin is to Donald Trump is a model of a good leader, a model of an effective leader, and a model of a popular leader. He's running this country, and at least he's a leader, you know, unlike what we have in this country. It's a very scary model and any aspect of it that Vladimir Putin does right now, that Donald Trump would like to do, would mean an America that we would not recognize. Well, he does have an 82% approval rating. He's also a guy who annexed Crimea, invaded Ukraine, supports Assad in Syria, supports Iran.
North Korea has nukes. Japan has a problem with that. I mean, they have a big problem with it. Maybe they would, in fact, be better off if they defend themselves from North Korea. Maybe with we nukes. would be better off, including with nukes. Yes, including with nukes. And South Korea with nukes. South Korea is right next door. Instead of having South Korea, Japan, and other allies um, develop their own nuclear weapons programs, they rely on our nuclear forces. If they're attacked, they don't have to worry about having their own nuclear weapons because they know for a fact that we will come to their aid. We extend our nuclear umbrella over them. What Trump is saying is that we should withdraw that. For decades, one of the bedrocks of American foreign policy has been stopping nuclear proliferation and specifically providing security to some of our allies in exchange for, at least in part, that they not seek nuclear weapons. That's been true under all administrations, Republican and Democrat. Donald Trump is promoting a new policy. With Trump, you have him wanting to withdraw the nuclear umbrella, which means that our allies, Japan, South Korea, are more likely to want to try to develop their own nuclear weapons because they feel threatened and they don't have that guarantee anymore. Our alliance with Japan and the Republic of Korea. It has prevented the possibilities of uh, a nuclear escalation and conflict. It would completely destabilize um, the kind of security structure that we've had in East Asia for the last several decades. So the person who made the statements doesn't know much about foreign policy or nuclear policy or the Korean Peninsula or the world generally. That also means that we no longer really have influence there. So we can use the fact that we are your security guarantee, we are your backers, um, we have your back. We can use that to say, okay, but we need you to do X, Y, and Z. With this long, hellish election finally coming to a close, it's been easy throughout, and I think this is a reason Donald Trump has done as well as he has done, to just laugh at his funnier comments, see him as a bit of a buffoon and a clown, and just not engage with what he says on any serious level. And that's a disservice, and it's dangerous, especially on foreign policy, because that's where President Trump would have the freest hand to do what candidate Trump says he would do. 